Good morning. Merry Christmas. Isn't that what we're supposed to say today? All the time we say Merry Christmas like every Christmas is merry and supposed to be merry and everybody's experiencing a Merry Christmas. You know what I found out? We sing about silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. There are some Christmases that aren't that way. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lays down his head. It just sounds like everything is peace and everything is quiet. And so it was in that first Christmas. And so it's supposed to be that way in your Christmas. But you know it's not that way all the time, is it? There are a lot of people in our world that aren't facing a calm and silent night on Christmas. They're facing a storm. And what I want you to understand today, what I want to try to share with you today is the very first Christmas was not a silent night. It was a holy night, but it wasn't a a silent and peaceful night. It was a time filled with storm. The first Christmas came in a storm. And I want you to understand that and and, and understand that. Uh, We're going to be looking in Matthew's gospel uh, in a little bit, but in Luke's gospel, the first Christmas focuses on Mary. And just, there's just one thing after another about Mary and all the things that she went through. Her, her husband, Joseph, is, is, is the only one, there was only one mention of him even in, in Luke's gospel. Matthew's account, on the other hand, story mentions Mary's name only three times. Matthew focuses primarily on Joseph with very little mention about Mary. Nothing but much said about her at all. Uh, he, he tells us what the angel said to Joseph. Remember what he said? Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. How did he respond to that? We're going to look at that. Uh, he tells us about the visit of the wise men. He tells us about the dream uh, in which the, the, the angel came to him and warned him uh, that Herod was going to kill all the babies two years old and under. And so he says, warned him, take your baby to Egypt. And so he goes off to Egypt uh, after just a few months of the baby being there. And then after a period of time, we hear about Joseph. Again, the angel comes to Joseph again and tells him, go back to Nazareth, go back home. And, and he takes his baby and his family back to Nazareth, where for the next almost 30 years, Uh, He serves as a carpenter as far as we know and helps Jesus to grow up to be the man that he needs to be and wants to be. I want want us to, to see that Joseph is a main character in Matthew. I want us to look at that scripture and give you an idea of what we're talking about as we think about the first Christmas coming in a storm. In Matthew chapter 1 in verse 18, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus. Familiar passages. Joseph must have thought this was going to be the happiest time of his life. I mean, he now has met the girl of his dreams. He's going to get married to a woman that he has long admired, no doubt, uh, along the way. Uh, And I I remember that time. I'll never forget the night that Becky proposed to me and asked me to marry her. Well, you think it's funny. Well, I didn't, I I was happy. I was thrilled to death. Uh, We were both very mature, 18 years old, 
that, that's good. Uh, and uh, we, we, I would go out and eat a free meal every night at her house. That was our date during the week. And, and we would uh, sit on the couch and watch TV, maybe kiss every now and then, you know, and, that, and just talk and carry on a little bit. And so one night, her parents had gone to bed. We got up off the couch, going to walk out through the kitchen. She goes over, picks up the calendar, said, if we're going to get married, we need to select a date. She said, I think October 27th fits well. I said, well, that's great. There's only one problem, Becky. I, I haven't asked you to marry me officially yet. We'd been dating for almost two years. And so I got down on my knees. I'm supposed to. I could do it back then. And, uh, and I asked her to marry me. It was a happy time. I mean, we were just thrilled to death for the next months, and I mean, just everything. Uh, we were, that, that must have been how Joseph and Mary were. Don't you remember when you were in that state? If you've been married and been through that, how happy you were. Everything is throwing, everything was fine. They were all, both looking forward to it. Families were all looking forward to everything that was going on and everything that was happening. Joseph loves Mary, right? Mary loves Joseph. Both Mary and Joseph love the Lord. I mean, they are set to have a great marriage and a, and a great life. So they're planning their wedding. They're praising God for his blessings and bringing them together. There's no doubt the happiest time in their lives up to that point until the storm arrives. An angel tells her she's been chosen by God to have, uh, have the Messiah. And she says, okay, that's great. I, I'll do that. I'll follow your will, God. But all the happiness and all the joy that had been circling around the family now all dissipated very quickly. The winds of doubt and the winds of change brought on by the storm in their lives came about that alters all their plans and threatens to even cancel the wedding. All their joy and all their hopes and all their dreams are dissolved by the words of the angel. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and you will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Did you catch that? Mary, you have found favor with God. And because you found favor with God, he's going to put you through a storm. And all of your plans and all the things you thought what you wanted to do and all the goals you had for your life and all the expectations you thought, everything changes now, Mary. Everything changes. The storm's going to change all of that. We don't know who told Joseph the news that his fiance was pregnant, but you can only imagine whoever that was. It had to be someone that just ex exploded every dream that Joseph had ever had uh, along the way. Uh, we don't know who it was. We can only imagine, though, the emotions that he felt. We know very little about Joseph after the birth of Jesus. He, he isn't mentioned much. Not much is said about him. But for some reason, Matthew focuses on Joseph that first Christmas instead of Mary in his gospel. I wonder, what did Joseph say to Mary the first time he saw her? What, what was it that, what, what would be his first question that he would want to ask her the first time he saw her after the announcement? Did he even talk to her the first time he saw her? Or, or who did he talk with? We, we don't really know what he was thinking, but did he have a friend that he could go to? But we can only imagine the emotions he must have experienced. It had to be a storm of emotions going up and down and all, all around. Uh, did he cry when he was told she was pregnant? Did he get angry with Mary when he heard the news? Did he get angry with God? When he heard the news, he must have thought she had been unfaithful to him because his first instinct was to give her a bill of divorcement. Because he was a righteous man, he didn't want to punish her. He just wanted to get her out of his life. And he was ready to do that until the angel spoke to him. Did he have anyone at all to talk to about what he should do? Or did he have to do what many of us have to do when we face a storm in life and that's just face it all alone.
Mary is the star of the Christmas story. Don't doubt that. Not Joseph. But he, Joseph, is the one God chose to protect the baby Jesus. During this time frame when he couldn't do anything just as an infant. Uh, and he probably had more influence. And listen, Joseph probably spoke to Jesus more than any other man in those formative years when he was growing up. But here's the key. We have absolutely no words recorded by this man who had that greatest influence upon Jesus. Not one word is recorded in the Bible of his words. And that's why I call Joseph the silent hero of the Christmas storm. He is the one who stood strong. He is the one who stood tall. He's the one who stood up. He's the one who had the great faith to be able to not only accept God, but to accept Mary. And the news, Mary is the star, but he's the one God chose to protect the baby Jesus. He wasn't rich. He wasn't powerful. He wasn't educated. Uh, he, he wasn't famous, but, but throughout this storm of emotions that both, both of those two and all the entire family for that matter were going through, he's the one who stood tall. He's the one who stands above everybody else. He's the one Matthew put into the place of leadership to stand tall as a silent hero in that first Christmas storm. Why? Why is he such a hero? Mary's the one who carried the baby Jesus in her body. But Joseph is the one who carried Mary. He carried her from place to place. He carried her from town to town. He carried her and her baby that was born. You see, Joseph not only believed in God, Joseph also believed in Mary. And that's why he's the silent hero of this Christmas story. But the first Christmas wasn't just one storm, was it? It wasn't just the fact that here uh, his, expect, his wife uh, is now going to have a child that Joseph knows is not his. Everybody else may think it is. Everybody else may question whose it is. But he knows it's not his child. And yet he is that silent uh, hero uh, of Christmas. He is, he is the one that is going to take the stand, and he's the one who's going to, to do what needs to be done uh, along the way. But there were more storms that come along with that. The next thing he knows, he has to travel 70 miles with his new wife that he's married now, who is, is pregnant and ready to, to have the child, all the way 70 miles from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem, and all they had to ride on is a donkey. How would you you imagine uh, being pregnant at eight, nine months and having to ride a donkey 70 miles in that hot desert type of area. And so the storm continues. He gets there and, and, and he's so poor that he, he can't buy a room. He can't get a place to stay. So he has to have his, his, his baby. That baby has to be born now in the manger, uh, in, in a stable. And now he has to go through where all the animals are. And who's going to be, have you ever thought, ladies, who's going to be there to attend Mary? Who's going to help her to have a baby? Not her mother, which she would have had if she'd stayed in Nazareth. Strangers. 70 mile journey, have the baby in a stable and following nothing but strange faces around you when your child is born. And not just a few months, maybe a year or so afterwards, Joseph also has another dream and he says, Herod is going to kill uh, every child two years and under and so you've got to get out of here. Don't just leave your, your people here in, Naz in Bethlehem. You need to go to Egypt, which is miles away. So he has to take his young family and travel many more miles of storms continue. And then after so long there, we're not told exactly how long, now the angel says, okay, Herod is dead, now you can come back home. And he comes back home, but afraid he doesn't go back to Bethlehem. He goes back to Nazareth. The storm, one storm after another storm after another storm. And God used Joseph to guide his new family through all those storms of his family that first Christmas. 
God never told him he had to take Mary as his wife. He never threatened him if he didn't take Mary as his wife. He he wasn't forced to become her husband. The angel spoke to him in a dream and simply said, don't be afraid to take Mary home with you as your wife. Don't be afraid. He didn't say, you need to do that, Joseph. You better do that, Joseph. If you don't do that, Joseph, you're going to be in 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 a mess in your life. He had the freedom to become the silent hero of Christmas and follow God's will, or he had the freedom to reject all of it and walk away from that storm, go find another woman that he could marry, have a happy family life, and we would never know anything about this man we call Joseph. I want to teach you some lessons about how to handle the storms of life. How many of you in your past have gone through a storm? Can we see a hand? All right. Some of you have been fortunate evidently so far. All right. You don't have to raise your hand, but if you would, how many of you are going through a storm right now? Yeah. All right. Now, how many of you think you will be going through a storm at some time in your future life? If you didn't raise your hand, you are naive. If you didn't raise your hand, you've not read your Bible very well. Because it's very, very obvious what God uh, is, is doing and, and how God handles the storms uh, in our life. Uh, it isn't Will you face a storm? But when will you face the storms? And how will you respond to those storms? Job said it this way. Man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble and then he dies. First thing I want you to see, the first lesson I want you to understand is that every storm that ever comes your way will pass. Every storm that you ever face in your life is going to come, it's going to do its damage, it's going to do its work, and then it's going to pass. I preached for almost 50 years that God only uses broken things. I I thought I had been broken before, but now I realize I was only half cracked. I I didn't really know what it meant to be broken. Uh, Now I do. Not long ago, I read this, and and it makes sense, and now I believe it, and I, I want you to consider it. In an impossible situation, God will use an impossible person and crush him to perform a miracle. In an impossible situation, God will take an impossible person and crush him to produce a miracle. Do you feel like you've been crushed? Or or do you feel like you've been broken by a storm? If you do, you're in great company. Joseph, the man we're talking about this morning, he was crushed. You can imagine what his thoughts were and what his feelings were and what, what, what he assumed and what he had to deal with. Yeah, he was, he was crushed. You can look at so many other people in the Bible like Moses uh, who was crushed, had to live in the wilderness for 40 years before God could use him where he could learn the lessons and then be used by God in great ways, but he was crushed uh, along the way. Uh, you can look at Peter who was crushed and became the leader of the church. You can look at Paul who was crushed and blinded and, and, and suffered in so many ways, but he was the greatest church planner of all time and God used him in tremendous ways. You can look at Abraham Lincoln in my estimation was the greatest president we've ever had and what God did to crush him from every aspect of his life. He was crushed from the beginning to the end. He was crushed and yet God used him to save our nation and to do so much good. Winston Churchill was crushed, yet he became the great leader that saved the free world from Hitler and and his strength and, and his leadership allowed that to happen. And of course, you can always think about Jesus who was crushed, who was broken, who was crucified. And God brought miracles out of every one of those men's lives. That's what God does in an impossible situation. He'll take an impossible person, crush him, 
to produce a miracle. I counted 22 times in the book of Joshua, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it came to pass. Over and over and over and over again it says, and it, and it came to pass. The, the, the people of Israel ha, had come out of slavery in Egypt, wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and they come up to the, uh, to the Holy Land, and, and they march into the Holy Land, and, and they see this first battle with Jericho, and they see the walls around them, and they say, this is an impossible battle at Jericho. There's no way we can overcome those walls. But it came to pass that the walls came tumbling down by themselves. There were Canaanite tribes all over the place, more powerful. They were armies uh, that had been trained to be able to overcome uh, any enemy that comes along. And so as the Israelites move into the land to conquer the land, they see all the Canaanite tribes. But it came to pass that they defeated every one of them along the way. There was a, a problem in crossing over the, the Jordan River into the promised land because it was flooded. But it came to pass, the Bible says, that the Jordan River went up dry and all the people walked across on dry ground into the promised land. Joseph, Joseph and Mary are following God's will and yet they have had to endure one storm after another storm after another storm after another storm. Have you, have you discovered in your life that following Jesus sometimes leads you into a storm? Yeah. Following Jesus oftentimes will lead us into a storm. When Job was going through his storms, one storm after another storm after another, this storm is what he, this is what he said in the midst of the storms. If only I knew where to find God. That's a good one. When you're in a storm, you're looking for God, aren't you? A lot of people pray in a storm that never pray any other time. But Job says this, if only I knew where to find God in his storm, if only I could go to his dwelling. But if I go to the east, he's not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When, when he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. In other words, Job is saying, I'm going through a series of storms and I can't find God anywhere. Anybody ever been there besides me? I've been preaching about the storms in life for 50 years this next April. But I've learned more about storms in the last two years than in all the other 48 years combined. And when I look over this crowd, everyone looks nice. I see one person even smiling. Just one, but that's, a, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I can't see it, but some of you are going through a storm, I know. Every time I preach through these 50 years, there's been someone in the audience who was facing a storm. But, but I've learned more about storms recently. I, I can't see it, but I know some of you are going through a private storm, maybe with money, something as silly as money. Don't, don't worry about money. That'll take care of itself. Just work a little bit harder. Spend a little bit smarter. And you can deal with it. Don't, don't spend your, waste your time worrying about money. Just discipline yourself. And you won't have those storms about your money that, that you have to face. Uh, don't worry about your marriage. If each of you in your marriage would just start making the priority, how can I meet your needs? And ask the other one, how can I meet your needs? What is it I need to do or become in order to meet your needs? You wouldn't have to worry about your marriage anymore. The problem is what you're doing is you're fighting to be able to be the boss in the marriage and have the other person force them to meet your needs and you're not worrying about their needs. So there's a storm developing or already brewing because uh, of, of the fact that you're not trying to, to do what you need to do. H how about a prodigal? Do you have a prodigal storm going on in your life? A son or a daughter become that teenager? I don't know what happens to them when they become teenagers. Something does, though. I know that. 
You know, they just change. Something come, someone comes and inhabits them, and then they leave when they get to be about 20, 21 years old, and then they're freed again. How about your health issues? You have any health issues? I didn't have any health issues. For the, I can do about everything I wanted to do up to about 50 some, and then all of a sudden, all the abuses I'd been making with sports and activities and all those things that began to show up. But eventually, eventually, we all have health uh, issues that, that we have to deal with along the way. How about just emotional storms? Having trouble with your emotions for whatever reason, you know, you know hormones or circumstances or situations, what is it? People can't see the pressure you feel right now. I can't see that pressure that you feel right now. But I know some of you are there. See, we're all very good at hiding our emotions, aren't we? When we come to a church, we'll put on our best clothes, put on our best face, put on our makeup and, uh, you know, all that stuff if we need it. And so we can't see it. We're, we're good at hiding our emotions. Uh, you can't see God in your storm and, and you feel so alone. And uh, even in a crowd this size, it's like you're the only one here, right? That's what happens when you're in a storm. So I want you to understand that your storm did not come to stay in your life for the rest of your life. That your storm didn't come to stay. It came to pass. And it will. It will. Listen to this lesson. You think you know the story of David and Goliath, don't you? And any one of you could stand up here and give the details about the story of, of David and Goliath. But let me tell you the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. God did not send David to that valley that day where the two armies of the Philistines and the Israelites were standing against each other on either side of that valley. God did not send David to that, to that place in that valley that day as a teenage shepherd boy to kill Goliath. That was not the message. That was not the point of the story. The story is, the main reason is, the purpose of all of that was that God sent Goliath to where David would be so David could kill Goliath and he could show King Saul, he could show the, the Philistines, he could show the whole army of, of, of Israel that David was not just a shepherd boy, David was a giant killer. And from that point on, everybody looked at that little shepherd boy differently. Everybody did not see him simply as a shepherd, but they said, this is a guy who can kill giants. And when they came to the point where they needed another king, what kind of king do you want? You want a giant killer, don't you? And David became the greatest king of all. But he proved that he was a king because God sent Goliath to where David would be so David, God could show that David was a giant killer. And he could take care of everything that he had to deal with. The giant storm you're facing today, as for David, is not for your destruction it's for your instruction. Can you take that home with you? Can you think about that today? God did not bring the storm into your life to destroy you, but to instruct you. He wants to teach you that you can be a giant killer. He wants to teach you that you are much more than what you ever thought you were. He wants, to, he wants you to learn once and for all that he created you uniquely to be able to accomplish things in life that you haven't even started working on yet. And maybe that storm in your life from whenever it was or whatever it is now is the only thing that's keeping you from becoming a giant killer. The only thing keeping you from being what God has, has created you to be.
You and God can defeat any giant and walk through any storm and be strong when it passes because weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And this is what I've learned about storms. Every storm passes. Every storm you go through passes. They didn't come to stay. They came to pass. There is life on the other side of divorce. There is life on the other side of, of divorce. Losing your job isn't the end of the world. We've all lost jobs. If you've been around any length of time, we've all lost jobs. It's not the end of the world. All of us will face illness eventually. You are no exception. And all of us will lose a loved one someday that we think we can't live without. Say this with me. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. I don't know how it will end, but I know it will pass. You may cry in the storm. You may struggle in the storm. You may suffer in the storm. You may be experiencing pain in the storm. You may end up crippled from the storm, but you're going to come out of it. You're going to come out of, of that storm because this storm did not come to stay. It came to pass. The night will end one day and joy will come in the morning. Second thing I want you to learn about the storms of life is that the presence of a storm does not mean the absence of God. The presence of a storm doesn't mean the absence of God. Uh, Matthew said, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. And the meaning of the name Emmanuel means God with us. So here's what's happening with the name. It mean, don't pass over this too quickly. The angel told Joseph in his Christmas storm that God wouldn't leave him alone. And, and the child now is called Emmanuel, which means God is with Joseph and God's there alone uh, with him. He, he, he's God, the, Emmanuel, Jesus, the, the Christ child, is God's promise that he's going to always be with us, that someone lives inside you, that someone has promise never to leave you nor forsake you that the power of the Holy Spirit lives within you and that means you can do all things through Christ who is always with you Joseph must have been wondering where God was in the midst of the storm that he was facing. And so God promises him in his first dream, the first time God spoke to him in that manner, God promised him he will always be with him because he is God with us. You want to know the real meaning of Christmas? We keep hearing everybody, oh, the real meaning of Christmas is, is this, and the real meaning of Christmas is about gifts, and the real meaning of Christmas is about children. No, Christmas is our annual reminder that we aren't alone, that God is with us. And some of us miss that in, 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 the, in the name Emmanuel. We miss the fact that God is promising us every year, Christmas, God is with us. We remember the child. We remember his name, that God is with us, and, and, and God is going to deal with us and, and help us uh, uh, along the way. So God promises in his first dream that he will always be with him. When we face a storm in our lives, we can sometimes feel like we've been abandoned by God. We pray and pray, and it seems like our prayers aren't getting above the ceiling uh, in, in our houses, in our minds. We believe, you see, if, if God is here with us, there would be no storm, right? Is that what really we think? If God were here, if God would take charge, there would be no storm in my life. In our minds, we believe that that. If, if God is in our life, that we'll be happy. We'll have no family problems whatsoever. We'll have no money problems, no health problems either. Nothing will be going like that. Some people in the eye of the storm have a hard time believing God is with them because they're in the storm. And they ask the hard questions 
that we all ask in the storms, if God is present, how could he let my young child die? How, how could he let my beautiful wife die? That's why I want you to learn this truth. The presence of a storm doesn't mean the absence of God. Don't you dare think that. Don't you dare think that. God does some of his best work in our storms. Some of God's greatest promises are given to help us fight the inevitable storms of life. When you pass through the water, I'll be with you. That's all we need to know. When it's a flood, the storm produces a flood, uh, he's going to be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you away. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I, the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God gives us many promises. The Bible's filled. I've got a little book at home uh, just it's filled with, that says God's promises out of the scripture and it's page after page after page uh, of the promises. But listen to me. When God makes us a promise, he's telling us, get ready for trouble. God gives a promise and written in that promise is, get ready for trouble. God's promises are to help you in the storms of life. You may not see him sometimes in that storm. You may not be able to have the ears to hear him sometimes, but he promises he's there with you. Your storm may look bigger than God, but it isn't. Your storm may look like it can overcome God, uh, but, but it cannot do that. So you need to settle the end of your storm before it ever takes place, before the beginning of the storm in your life. You need to settle all of this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, be encouraged in other words, but be strong, keep standing, don't give up on me. I have already overcome the world. Before the storm ever comes, you claim that promise. And with that promise comes the victory. He promises that when you go through a storm, he'll be with you. And he'll use that storm to make you stronger. And he will bring you out of that storm because the grace of God is sufficient in all things. And then lastly, the storms reveal our faith. Romans 8, 28 has been my life's verse since shortly after I became a Christian. It said, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I've learned that it's God's promise for the storms of life. He doesn't, he doesn't promise that he will always keep us from the storms or he'll always tell us why we had to go through uh, that particular storm. His promise is that if we love him, which means we obey his words, which means we live for him, which means we try to follow his will, then when the storm finally passes, and it will pass, that he will bring something good even out of the storm in your life. I've found that the test of your faith, the challenge of your faith, is how you handle the storms of life. It's easy to have a strong faith when things are going right, when the kids are all doing well, when everybody seems to be happy, the marriage is mutually fulfilling, prayers are being answered, there's no storm to challenge you on the horizon, but the test of your faith the test of who you really are, the test of, of your character is how you handle the storms. So your character isn't made in a storm, it's simply revealed in a storm. Your faith isn't made in a storm, it is made in the day-by-day -day routine of life where you're worshiping him, where you're serving him, where you're reading his word, where you're witnessing for him. But it's revealed when you're being blown about by a storm and you start sinking in the storm and you have no one to cling to except Jesus. That's when you find out where your faith really is. I know someone here today is in a storm. I know you are. Crowd this size, there's many 
people here in a storm. Some of you don't even know it yet, but you are. And you feel overwhelmed, some of you. It's Christmas time, and it's supposed to be a time of family and fun, but you're facing a storm. And, and, and you're here today because you're searching for a word to God and, uh, from God, and, and God told me to tell you this today. For those of you in that storm, don't be afraid. You can handle it. You can handle it. When you're going through a private storm, other people can't see it. They can't see what you have to deal with just to keep your life together. They don't know what you're facing along the way. They don't know how tough it is just to be you. They don't know the sickness that you have to face. They don't know the bills that you have to pay. They don't know the loneliness that you experience. They don't know the fa failures that you've had to face. They don't know you also get to the point where you have felt, if one more thing happens to me, I quit. When you're in a storm, it's okay to cry. But you can handle it. You may be depressed sometimes when you're in the midst of a storm, but you can handle it. You may feel like you're all alone in the world, but you can handle it. You may feel like you're going to break down at any moment, but you can handle it because God's with you and he'll never leave you. And the grace of God is, is sufficient. And that's what enables you to stand even in the midst of the storm. Someone over here isn't able to handle what you're going through today. They can't handle it, but you can handle it. You can handle it. And there's somebody over here that's not as strong as you are. Somebody over here that, 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 that is weaker than you. And they're not able to handle it, but you can handle it. You can handle it. How do I know that? Christmas is God's promise for the storms of life. His name was, is, and always will be. Emmanuel, God is with us. You can handle it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word today. Thank you for all the ways in which you have demonstrated your love for us. Lord, you have been there for us. Lord, you have proven yourself over and over and over and over and over again. And I pray today that the lessons, the lessons from Joseph, the man who had the most influence upon the young Jesus, and how God used him in the midst of all the storms he faced would help and encourage those who are in the storm right now and those who will be in the storms in the future that the storms are not greater than our God. And like David, we can be giant killers. We can overcome anything. We can handle it because you're with us. God, Emmanuel, is with us. In Jesus' name, amen.